I'm sorry if the audio quality in this episode is bad. I'm currently trying to work out this new recording situation, so I'm, I'm doing my best. Well, after such a heavy episode, it's nice to get back to some campy space antics. I'm sure nothing tragic will happen in this episode- Jim's brother is dead? Wait, is that just Bill Shatner in a fake mustache? Ahura has been trying to get through to a colony on a planet called Deneva to no avail. Spock has picked up on a pattern of planets utterly desolated due to mass insanity, and that Deneva is expected to be affected next, as he points out on his light bright map. Kirk has special reason to worry, as his brother Sam, sister-in-law Aurelin, and nephew Peter happen to reside there. On their way, they witness a Denevan spacecraft fly directly into a sun, its pilot gleefully broadcasting that he's free as he burns to a crisp. Leonard Nimoy actually provided the voice. The crew of the Enterprise worry that they may be too late to save Deneva from the madness. As they approach, they receive a transmission from Jim's sister-in-law, who sounds distressed and afraid, begging for help. Kirk and a landing party beam down to find the planet suspiciously quiet. Suddenly, a group of men attack them, but not before oddly trying to warn them to leave. The landing party stun them and run off at the sound of a woman's scream. It's a Relin, who claims that someone or something is here. Young Peter is unconscious on the floor, and Jim's brother Sam is dead. Poor guy just can't catch a break. Jim and Bones beam back up with Peter and Arelin, the latter of whom tries to tell Jim about something that was brought aboard a ship to Deneva. Sharing this information causes her excruciating physical pain, similar to Simon Van Gelder in Dagger of the Mind. She manages to divulge that they are controlling the people on Deneva, forcing them to build ships for them, and begging Jim to stop them before her heart gives out from the sheer agony she's in, and she dies. Back on the planet, the landing party finds a hive of single-celled parasitic pancake bats camped out in a shady spot. Fun fact, the pancake bats were created by prop designer Wa Chang from Bags of Fake Vomit. Now, I'm sure one of you f***ing losers is in the comments right now typing, Um, actually, in a Star Trek novel, they were called the nya 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 but f*** you, this is my channel, I do what I want, I'm calling them the Pancake Bats. Jim and the others shoot at them, but even at the highest setting, their phasers do nothing. As they turn to leave, one of them flies out from hiding and attaches itself to Spock's back, injecting him with its tissue, which spreads throughout his nervous system and takes control of him like the Denovans. Spock makes a mad dash to hijack the Enterprise, but being only one man against a whole bridge crew, his efforts are futile. With a Herculean effort only made possible by Spock's strict Vulcan discipline, he's able to fight the pain and regain some control of himself. He requests to be allowed to beam down and capture a pancake bat for analysis, since he's already been infected. Making an educated guess from their observation of the Denovan who kamikazed into the sun to be free of the pancake bat's influence, they expose the specimen to extreme amounts of heat and radiation. However, nothing seems to affect it. Bones and Spock are stumped. If they don't find a way to neutralize the pancake bats, Kirk will have no choice but to prevent the spread of the parasites by wiping out Spock, his nephew, and the million people residing on Deneva. What other qualities or properties does the sun have? It exists physically. <laughs> Literally, thing exists. Jim, we've been through it and through it. Radiation, heat, and one other thing you haven't mentioned. It's bright. How did they miss that? Two scientists in the room, and the himbo was the one who realized sun is bright. Shiny. To test their theory, they put the specimen in the Enterprise's tanning bed, and Bones blasts it with the blinding ray of light. Sure enough, it destroys the pancake bat. Then, in order to see if light will free the host, Spock gets in the booth, with no eyewear to protect him. Mr. Spock's the best first officer in the fleet. Proceed. After the procedure, Spock emerges from the booth, free of the pain, but at a cost. I'm also quite blind. Bones then discovers to his horror that he needn't have exposed Spock to the whole spectrum of light to cure him, since some forms of light, like UV light, have wavelengths that are too short to be perceived by the human eye. Or the half-Vulcan eye, as it were. You're telling me that Spock need not have been blinded? I didn't need to throw the blinding white light at all, Jim. It is done. Bones. Take care. I don't think Jim ever gets angry at Bones like he does here.
but then again, we know how he reacts when Spock gets hurt. He does forgive Bones in the next scene, though. After dealing with the pancake bats on Deneva and saving the people, Spock arrives on the bridge, amazingly with his eyesight intact. Turns out that Vulcans have a sort of secondary inner eyelid that can protect them from extreme amounts of light. Convenient, right? Some Earth species, including cats, also have a similar trait called a nictitating membrane, which only strengthens my personal headcanon that Vulcans evolved from felines in the same way that humans evolved from primates. Anyway, Spock calls Bones fugly and everything is back to normal. Please don't tell Spock that I said he was the best first officer in the fleet. Why, thank you, Dr. McCoy. You've been so concerned about his Vulcan eyes, Doctor. You forgot about his Vulcan ears. So this episode, full of death and torture and potential genocide, ends on a comical note. And whatever happened to little Peter Kirk? Well, that, dear friends, is revealed in a deleted scene that never made it to broadcast. The Chuck Cunningham of Star Trek. I need someone to write a fanfic where Peter stays on the Enterprise and Jim has to balance being a captain with raising his nephew. It feels nice to end the season on such a quaint little episode. Imagine if we'd had to end on such a downer like City on the Edge. We don't have to dive too deep into this one, it's just a fun little space adventure. We do get some nice moments with our core trio, which is definitely the heart of the original series. Bones and Spock's love-hate relationship and Jim's gentle amusement at their bickering is always fun. And the way Jim is so protective over his best friend is so sweet and touching. I want to end this video by thanking my subscribers and people who like and leave comments on these videos. When I started this series two years ago, I never kidded myself into thinking my audience would get this big. But here we are. So, thank you. It's been a pleasure diving into this first season with you, and I can't wait to get started on season two. In the meantime, I'm going to make a video of jokes and bonus features from the making of this first season. I want to give a special thanks to my pals Sarah, Charlie, Josh, Dan, Russell, and Hayes, people who I've really connected with throughout this series. Your encouragement and insight have been a big incentive throughout all of this. I've got a Patreon if you're interested in checking that out. I generally release non-Trek videos 24 hours early there, and if you're a patron you get perks such as being mentioned by name in the credits of my videos, and getting voting privileges on what topics I make videos about next. I've got so many ideas for the future of this channel. I've also got a PayPal if you just want to make a one-time contribution instead. And as always, follow me on social media. I tend to give hints and updates on what I'm working on and when I'm posting. The links for all that are in the doobly-doo. This is Captain Wren, signing off.